Welcome to Bellingham Voices. I'm your host, Deb Slater. Pacific Northwest Insects is a 528-page book. It's a field guide for experts and amateurs, and it features 1,200 insects from our region. Professor from Western Washington University and author of this book, Merrill Peterson, is with us today. Welcome to Bellingham Voices, Merrill. Thanks. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about this book uh, in a little bit, but first, let's get to know you a little bit. Now, your fascination with bugs started at a pretty early age, right? Yeah, ever since I can remember anything, really. Um, apparently, when I was a little kid and we, we lived in Germany, We'd go to the zoo and, and I was three years old or something like that and I was, I guess, nearsighted enough that instead of looking at the lions and tigers and bears, I'd be looking at the bumblebees in the foreground. <laughs> so ever since then, really, but it kind of took off when I was about 11 years old. So why the fascination? Well, I think part of it is that they're so approachable that, that you can actually really get close to an insect, have it in your hand, have it crawling on your finger. Um, they're incredibly diverse and varied, so it's kind of like real-life Pokemon. There's always a new one to find. <laughs> right, right. Um, when did you know that you wanted this to be your life's work? By the time I was 15, I, I had pretty much figured out that I wanted to be a professional entomologist and that I wanted to go to graduate school and get my doctorate and end up at an academic institution. So from then on, I was pretty much wired into whatever I needed to do to, to meet that goal. So at the age of 15, that's not really, I don't want to say normal, but it's not, it's not a, a traditional interest of a teenager. How, how did you find yourself navigating through that? Yeah, well, as an entomologist, by definition, I'm not normal. And, and so... <laughs> So I, I, I guess I was certainly an awkward teenager. Um, I was really tiny as, as a high schooler, so I was, I was sort of this mini professor kind of kid um, that was, I don't know, uh, one of those high school dorks who found his way outside of high school. Yeah. <laughs> and you were telling me earlier a story about when you were 17. A summer when you were 17. Tell us that story. Yeah, so a, a, a friend of mine who lived in Issaquah, I grew up in Seattle, so we would often get together and go collecting. Uh, he, we were collecting buddies, and, and uh, we decided we wanted to go to this national meeting of a group called the Lepidopterist Society, which is a, a group of professional and amateur butterfly and moth specialists. And, and so this meeting was in Laramie, Wyoming, and, and we saved up our pennies and, and got Greyhound bus tickets and went down to the King Street Station in Seattle and <laughs> hopped on the Greyhound, and 36 hours later we were in Laramie. And, managed to, to enjoy the whole meeting and then uh, we connected up with a group of people who were surveying the butterflies in the, in the Rockies of Colorado that summer. They'd been doing a many summers long survey. And so we managed to tag along with them for another three weeks after the meeting, got to see all kinds of great country and, and see all kinds of cool insects. And then we got a ride from, from Bob Pyle back to, um, to the Northwest because he was heading to the Portland area. And Bob Pyle's, um, he, he was actually the person who wrote the original butterfly field guide for Washington that was, was kind of one of the things that really clinched it for me. So he was yeah. kind of a rock star to you, right? Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it was really cool to be able to, to get a ride back with him. And he actually helped arrange the whole uh, summer experience as well. So. so it sounds like when you were younger, you, you developed relationships that really opened doors for you. Yeah, yeah. When I was, I don't know, probably 14, something like that, I, I really started spending a lot of time with... Um, professional entomologists who uh, were, worked with Cooperative Extension and who worked at the Burke Museum. I was always going to the Burke Museum at the UW and hanging out with the, the spider and bu butterfly curators there. We had endless field trips together, um, you know, oftentimes taking my parents' car because neither of them had a car and I didn't know how to drive, so they'd drive. And um, so it worked out for everybody and then eventually I got my license and, and Off I, was, I was able to drive them. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Um, in the book, in the acknowledgement section of your book, you thank your parents and your sister for their encouragement and also for the tolerance of a house full of insects, including the kitchen freezer. What was in the kitchen freezer? 
at you, any given time. You name it. So uh, typically I would often collect more insects than I, than I could process, than I could curate at, at a given time. In fact, this continues through to this day. And so the, the material that I didn't have time to get to, I would put in the freezer as a way of safekeeping. So it would be easy to work with once I thawed it out again. Um, so I had, I had all kinds of insect specimens that were, that were in the freezer. <laughs> Sometimes there were escaped larvae, uh, caterpillars that were crawling around the house when I was trying to raise butterflies and every once in a while somebody would step on one of those and oh no, <laughs> yeah, oh no, <laughs> gross out. And <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, you went to UW mm -hmm. and then you went to Cornell mm -hmm. and then t talk us through from there to when you got to Western. Yeah, so I did my graduate work at, at Cornell. Um, I, I actually was so enamored of the Northwest insects that every summer I'd drive back and, and my dissertation research was on a Northwest butterfly species. And, and so I'd drive back to the, to the mountains and basically live out of a vehicle in the mountains studying these butterflies all summer long. Um, and then after graduate school, I went on to University of Maryland where I did a postdoc working um, in salt marshes along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast studying these little leafhopper-like insects called plant hoppers. Uh, and then from there I got my job here at Western and so that was back in 97 when I started here. Started at Western in 1997. Okay, so that brings us to this book, kind of, because this is a huge labor of love. 528 pages. You said that you've done the mental math. How many hours? At least 10,000 hours. And, and 10,000 hours. Yeah. And when did you what year was it that you decided that you wanted this to become, you wanted to make this book? It was really in, in 2003 to four, uh, when I was away in Germany on a sabbatical, uh, working at, at, in Hamburg uh, on a project that I'd been, uh, on a system that I'd been working with for many years, looking at hybridization in beetles. And it was, the, the project was starting to get narrower and narrower and more and more specific and more and more lab focused and less and less field focused and, and so I was finding myself in Germany feeling like I need something more than this. I need to do something that gets me back connected up with what inspired me to become a biologist in the first place. And so I, w I wanted to be able to do something that would immerse me in insect diversity and rekindle that love of being out in the field and, and finding new things. And, and so that was part of it. But I also wanted to be able to connect people to nature more. And so this was a project that really wedded those two pieces. And, and so um, it was then that I decided, OK, I'm going to start working on this book. I didn't realize at the time how big it was going to be or how much work it was going to be, I think. Had I realized that, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm glad I've, I've done it. Um, and, and so then I started taking pictures as soon as we got back from, from Germany. And so that was the summer of 2004. Uh, and pretty much every field season after that, up until the time the book was published, I was out in the field taking pictures of, of insects. And with your family? With my family. <laughs> By now you're married and you have a couple of kids, yep, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. So our kids were smallish when that started. Now they're all grown <laughs> up. Um, but we had many an adventure in our, in our VW camper van going all over the Northwest in, in pursuit of insects to, to really cool places. Um, probably too many hours in, this, in the car for, for small children <laughs> on many occasions. They still sometimes give me grief about that, but I know they also secretly enjoy the fact that they had all those adventures. Yeah, well, they're, they're part of this, yeah. right? That's yeah. so great. They must yeah. be so proud of you. Yeah, I, I, I suppose so. My daughter actually did the line art for the book. She's, she was an art major oh. at, at the U, and so while she was in college, she did the, the line art for the book. Wonderful. Well, as you can see, I, I mean, you've, there's a lot of intention behind this book to make it really user friendly. It's, you've got color coding, you've got um, color guides, maps, even um, size bars, diagrams. And uh, why was that so important to you? Well, I've, I've studied a lot of field guides over the years. I've, 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 I'm kind of a consumer of field guides. I think a lot of people are actually. People collect field guides. Uh -huh. and, and I've come to appreciate a well-made field guide and I've come to get frustrated with ones that are not well made. And, and so I wanted, a, I wanted to produce a book 
that was easy to use, that wasn't going to be a turnoff just because it was hard to navigate through it, and that had enough information that people could actually use it to identify with confidence insects to the level of, of species, which with almost all insect field guides is, is impossible. Uh, You'll look at, at an insect field guide for, say, insects of the Northwest, and it'll show you a black beetle that looks sort of like the one that you might be holding in your hand or see on the sidewalk, but it doesn't say if there are other similar species. It doesn't say what the size range is. It doesn't say what the color variation is. And so I tried to capture all of the, those nuances in the descriptions in these accounts. And you say that this is a, a guide for not only uh amateurs, but experts will get something out of this as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there is nobody in the Northwest who is an expert in all of the insects of the Northwest. It's, it's impossible. Uh, there are just too many species. And, and so every entomologist has their specialty, uh, certain groups that they are very expert in, uh, but they also are always running into other insects and they're curious about those. And so these are, these are trained entomologists who maybe don't know about stink bug diversity in the Pacific Northwest. Stink bug diversity in the <laughs> yeah. Northwest. And they, <laughs> and they can look at the field guide and, yeah. and identify the, the stink bugs that they're finding. Yeah. yeah. Why is that so important? Well, insects are hugely important for, for a lot of reasons, and so being able to identify insects and know what they are helps us understand whether they're pests or beneficials. It helps us understand whether they are a new invader or potentially a species that's previously unknown to science, so a new discovery uh, under our feet, which happens pretty frequently and, and is kind of a cool thing about biodiversity, that, that we can still be making these discoveries in an area where we've lived for so long. Um, but, but more than that, I think for, for the kind of the stepping back to that reason that I, I talked about earlier where I wanted to connect people with nature, mm -hmm. um, I think that, that one of the last best hopes for the environment is for a stronger connection between people and the natural world. And, and I think back to the last successful environmental movement, in my opinion, in this country, which was when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, and, and it led to this, uh, this ban of DDT and other pesticides and, uh, that were harming birds on up through the food chain. And the reason why I think people cared about that is because they already were familiar with the birds. And the reason why they were familiar with the birds is because there were good field guides in place for understanding bird diversity. And so if the organisms around us are anonymous to us, they're just a, you know, kind of a cool looking thing, but we have no idea what it is, we don't have that same level of connection to it as if we know that's a western conifer seed bug. That's really important, isn't it, yeah. for our future? Yeah, I think so. I, I think if people don't care about the organisms around them, then they're not going to care about all of the environmental issues that are affecting them. And in order to care, part of that is giving these things a name and knowing them, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Talk about that in the book. Um, also, you cite in the book uh, regarding the importance of insects a study from 2006 that actually puts a dollar amount on the services that insects do for us. I thought this was fascinating. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so the study basically compiled, um, it, it compiled all sorts of data on the kinds of services that insects provide, pollination services for crops. Uh, food as, as wildlife, uh, or food for wildlife like birds and fish. And, and then they tried to figure out, okay, how much of a dollar amount does the economy benefit from in terms of these activities? Uh, and it was in the billions, tens of billions of dollars annually uh, in, in the U.S. And another similar study did the same thing globally and found it was something like 150 billion uh, globally. And, and I think those are actually gross underestimates because many of the services that insects do are very hard to quantify, like uh, one of the things that, um, that insects do is process waste. So when an organism, when an animal poops or when an organism dies, there's 
dead organic material to be dealt with and if there aren't waste processors that stuff just builds up and and so there would be reduced nutrient cycling pastures would no longer be productive all these kinds of things that insects are doing um, and and so many of those sorts of things those harder to quantify effects are completely missing from the equation why do you think we we have this ew kind of reaction to insects when, well, they, when they, they're doing all of this for us, they're, we really, I mean, where would we be without them? Yeah. And, you know. Our, our world would but, collapse yeah, without them. Right. Um, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have coffee. We wouldn't have chocolate. We wouldn't have raspberries, blueberries, apples, avocados. All these great foods that depend on pollinators would disappear from our tables if we didn't have insects. And would we, we would be up to our heads in waste. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think, the, I think it, it probably is an ancient repulsion that may have to do with staying away from spoiling foods. And so if your food is crawling with insects, you avoid it because it's probably not going to be good to eat. You know, if you can sort of imagine Paleolithic people uh, encountering <laughs> yeah. food like that. Um, and so there could have been really strong evolutionary pressures to actually have this knee-jerk reaction to insects because that's a very direct and tangible impact of, of, of recognizing insects and thinking of them as bad. Mm -hmm. Recognizing the benefits is a lot less tangible and a lot less direct. I'm glad there's people like you to make us see the, the, see the love, the insect <laughs> love. Okay, getting back to the book. Lots of photos in this book. Mm -hmm. How many photos total? Something like 1,400 all told, and I took about half of those. That which is amazing. That's amazing. You must have stories of getting photos like like you had to go in the early morning or in the bog or something. What's oh, yeah. the craziest photo story you have? Uh, probably the craziest one is I was actually, uh, my wife and I were heading over to Pullman uh, late one summer. To, so that I could do some work in the collection there because a lot of the work involved, a lot of the work for the book involved doing research in, in insect collections. And on the way, we stopped in this canyon near Ellensburg and it was at the end of this dirt road and I stopped the camper, got out, <laughs> and there was a rattlesnake within just a few feet of the camper. What? <laughs> and so then I turn and there's another rattlesnake. And within, I don't know, 20 feet or so of the camper, there were five rattlesnakes <laughs> all in this one little area. And I was dead set on, on getting some good pictures that night. So I put out the, the light to attract some insects. And, and um, I just kind of kept an eye on where the, where the rattlesnakes were <laughs> and um, managed to get some really cool pictures there that and night. And your wife stayed in and the camper. And she camera. stayed in the, yeah, she <laughs> had better sense than I did. <laughs> there's another great story, and, and we'll just leave it for the viewers. If you want to read this story, it's called The Great Giant Flea Hunt. You Google it. Your wife actually wrote this story for the New York Times, and I'm glad that we're just going to tease it a little bit. I'm glad that story ended the way it did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we're going to say. It's called The Great Giant Flea Hunt. Uh, your wife wrote it for the New York Times. Great story. Um, so you also say that regarding the photos, um, it wouldn't have been, it almost would have been impossible without digital. Yeah, I, it would have been impossible. I. I started out taking pictures of insects when I was in high school. I, I had saved up money to buy a Canon film camera and a macro lens. And I remember feeling like I was happy if I got two or three really good images on a 36 slide right. roll. And that was very expensive, paying for all that film and processing. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, there was this big time lag. You'd take a picture and you wouldn't have any idea if it was going to come out until you got the processed film back. And so you couldn't reshoot. And, you'd, and oftentimes with insects, you can, you, if you could see that you, got, that you took a bad picture, you want to take another one right away and take many of the same insect to be sure you get one right. And so with digital cameras, you can take as many pictures as you want. Right. And, and so I got a, one of the first digital SLR cameras early on in the project. It was a Canon 10D. Um, which is considered to be a dinosaur of a digital camera now. I took most of the pictures in that book with that camera, um, the, the, of the ones that I took. And, and so 
I guess what that shows you is you don't need a huge number of pixels to be able to take good pictures. It's more important to have good control of the lighting and have good lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had very nice macro lenses and, and some very sophisticated flashes that I'd use that mounted to the end of those lenses. Mm -hmm. And now I see the importance of that in order to get, to get the picture, in order to identify in order to name in order to appreciate right right yep and yep. you also allowed your students to participate in that too over the years right yeah yeah so every every time I taught entomology which was uh, probably every other spring um, I would have a, a, a list of a wanted <laughs> list and I yeah. wanted them alive and, yeah. and so I, I would give the students extra credit if they found these things um, and they were typically insects that I really wanted to have pictures of and hadn't yet had the opportunity to find them um, or they were maybe very difficult to find and, and so um, I needed help and, and lots of insects were found that way over the years. What is so unique about the Pacific Northwest? I'd say the most unique thing is that we have an amazing diversity of habitats. So if you think about taking a drive from the coast to eastern Washington, for example. You go from these coastal dunes into, say, the Olympic rainforest, uh, and then in the, in the Puget Lowlands, there are these prairies that are down around Olympia, and then you're back into rainforests, and then you're up in alpine areas, and then you're heading over into the deserts. And it's just this tremendous variety in space that in other areas you just don't have. You take a drive across Kansas, the landscape doesn't change a whole lot. Right. You take a drive across New York, and there's some variation, but you don't go from rainforest to desert or anything close to that. So that kind of, of spatial variation means that there are all kinds of unique habitats for unique insects and other organisms to live in. What are you hoping people get from this book? Is Mostly, I'm hoping that the book helps people fall in love with insects the way I did when I was a kid. That's really my main, my main hope. That's wonderful. Well, it, how does it feel? Having it, I mean, it's here. <laughs> it's 528 a, it's a giant, pages. Right? It's a giant weight off of my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I, I, two years ago I thought the project was done and, and only just this summer did it finally come out. Um, there were so many pieces of it that, that took a huge amount of time because every time I'd make a, a change to how the species accounts looked, I had to do that 1,200 times. Um, just the indexing itself was two straight 70-hour weeks of applying little tags in InDesign so that the index could be created. I, my brain was bleeding after that. It was so horrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, yeah, having this done is, is really, really, um, it's gratifying, but it's also just a huge relief. And this features 1,200, mm -hmm. but that's just a tiny, tiny, just a slice of what, we, what actually is out there, right? Yeah, in the Northwest, we have about 30,000 insect species, and, and that's of the ones that are known. If you, if you add in all the ones that are yet to be discovered, it's probably double that or something. Um, so the book features 1,200. In the similar species sections of each species account, you can find tips for how to identify other species that are similar to those. So all told, you can identify about 3,000 insects I see. with the book. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about a tenth of the total species in the Northwest, which might sound like, oh, so 90% of the insects you're not going to be able to identify. But I've been here long enough, and I've been getting calls from the public and emails from the public about what is this insect that I'm seeing that I have a pretty good idea of what things people are likely to notice and wonder about and and so I've really featured those more heavily and and spent a lot less time uh, a lot less space in the book on obscure tiny soil insects for example that most people don't ever see sure sure you are kind of the the local bug guy People yeah. ask you to identify stuff all the time, right? Is yeah, it, yeah. Whether, whether in person or, or you know, via phone or email, I get I get a lot of contacts. More so now that the book is out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How do you? How does that make you feel? I, I have fun with that. I, I actually really enjoy that, and it's kind of it's hard for me to when I get a query like that. It's hard for me to put it down. I, I, I typically <laughs> want to I want to know. I want to be able to figure it out before I move on to the next thing. <laughs> I have a personal question, uh, just a question that I want to ask you. Okay. And this has been bugging me for years. So to speak. Yeah. 
can you just give me some justification for the mosquito, <laughs> please? I know it's a food source, right? right? But, but come on. There, and there are actually lots and lots of mosquito species. It's not just one. Oh, so, please. No, yeah. don't tell me that. <laughs> right. So, uh, so only, I don't know, a hundred out of the many thousands of insect species in the world, only a hundred or fewer are, are carry diseases that are problematic for people. Um, male mosquitoes, many of them pollinate flowers. Okay. Um, All right, I'll take it. Many uh, other, like you said, th they're food for lots of other things. So fish, dragonflies, frogs and salamanders. And so if we take away their food supply, they're going to be impacted. Okay. But I guess, and this really shows what, a, what, an, what an insect lover I am. I guess in my view, the whole premise of the question has a flaw in it, which is that it suggests that organisms need to have a purpose for us to have a justification for their existence. You are absolutely right. I stand humbled. <laughs> I am so sorry I asked you that question. <laughs> okay, one more question. Uh, two more questions. The first is, what's in your freezer at home right now? Well, which freezer? I've got, a bit, I've got one in the garage and one, one in the kitchen. And so they both have insects okay. in them. Um, the, the upstairs freezer in the kitchen has various butterflies and moths and beetles. Uh, the one downstairs has um, more of the same, but lots of, lots of other things as well. In fact, what I, what I did when I took pictures of insects for the book is I would collect a voucher specimen of it so that I could be sure of what its identity was later on. Uh, and so many of those vouchers are still awaiting processing in the freezer at home. Okay. <laughs> and your favorite insect? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I've always been partial to butterflies. But there's a, there's a beetle that's in the book that I really, really like called the banded alder borer, which looks sort of like a, like a zebra or something like that in its patterning. It's just this amazingly beautiful, striking, long-horned beetle. Wow, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> Meryl, thank you. Thank you for uh, writing this book and thank you for encouraging us to see the that I don't even I don't even know how to say it because if even I say if I see the value in insects I feel like I'm I'm I just thank you <laughs> for this. Um, where can we get it? Oh, so it can be gotten through um, through local bookstores. So Village Books either has it or can get it. Yep. Uh, if you want, you can order it directly from Seattle Audubon. You have to work your way through their website. It's a little bit clunky, but you can get there. And that's, it, that's a good way to buy it because they get more of the proceeds that way. Okay. Uh, or you can get it through the you know, other sources like Amazon. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank I'm you. I'm Deb Slater for Bellingham Voices. We'll see you next time.